Good morning. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you today. My name is Joan Gable and I'm honored to serve as the president of the University of Minnesota. And it's also my honor to welcome you to Inside the Pandemic, a candid conversation with Dr. Michael Osterholm and Andy Slavitt. Friends, I wanna to start today with gratitude to our incredible community of volunteers, public health champions, community partners, mentors and donors who've helped to make this conversation happen and who support the University of Minnesota's Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, also known as CIDRAP, and our School of Public Health in so many critical ways. We're humbled by your generosity, your time, your talent, and your financial support. And speaking of generosity, I'm very pleased to foreshadow that at the end of today's conversation, you will hear a very exciting announcement that underscores a profound commitment to grow the impact of our school and the center. But first, you're in for a real treat, an important conversation about the COVID-19 pandemic from two of the nation's experts who will cover the challenges and opportunities we're facing and really look at what comes next. So let's meet our speakers. Andy Slavitt served as the White House Senior Advisor for the COVID response for President Joe Biden. He also served as President Barack Obama's head of Medicare and Medicaid and oversaw the turnaround, implementation, and defense of the Affordable Care Act. He is the founder and board chair emeritus of United States of Care, a national nonprofit health advocacy organization, as well as a founding partner of Town Hall Ventures, a healthcare firm that invests in underrepresented communities. His best selling book, Preventable, was released this year and provides an account of our nation's COVID response. Welcome, Andy, and thank you for being here. Thank you for Next having me. My, our pleasure too. Next, we have our very own Dr. Michael Osterholm, a three time University of Minnesota alum who has served on our faculty since 1976 and across seven of our 17 presidents. He is Regents Professor, McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in Public Health, and the Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, and a leading expert for measured and accurate information about the pandemic, most recently serving on President-elect Joe Biden's COVID-19 Transition Advisory Board. He is also the author of the New York Times bestseller, Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. And we are so proud to have Dr. Osterholm as our colleague and also as our friend. So on behalf of a great, grateful university and a curious community, we thank both of our guests for being here and for all they do for the University of Minnesota, the country and the world. And it's in this spirit that I'm very happy to turn it over to Andy and Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I got to know Mike Osterholm starting literally about one month before the pandemic um, came to the U.S., at least one month before we, we, we knew it did. And there was uh, not a more timely uh, introduction I could have had uh, to someone who I think has become uh, one of the country's great resources um, and who oversees one of the country's great resources uh, relative to helping us I'll go through this pandemic. So we're going to have a, a great conversation and then he's going to go some really fun places. Um, and Mike, I want to start out at a really, really high level. Um, we have about 20 to 25% of our country that doesn't seem to be um, on board with science. They seem to have um, an anti-expert, um, anti-scientific, um, anti-institutionalist, Kind of perspective that is in this country today. Um, and so the question for you and for, for all of us, given that, that it ends up being costly, not just necessarily to them, but to our country, how do we get people on board? How does science um, and science communication reach um, the masses? Well, first of all, Andy, thank you so much for uh, being part of this today. Uh, my respect for you is immense, as you know. For those who uh, are listening today, let me just say that uh, I think all of you are well aware of the famous quote from the late Colin Powell, that if you break it, you own it. Uh, in the circles that I run in, the quote is, if it's broken, you can't fix it, call Andy. And so uh, we have uh, very much appreciated his leadership and support through this time. Well, let me, let me start out answering that question with just some sobering information that should uh, put perspective to that very important issue. Yesterday, Minnesota had 80 cases per 100,000 population of COVID. How does that relate to anything? Well, it's the highest in the country. We were the 
top state in the country. But more specifically, had we been a country ourselves, we would have had the 10th highest per capita incidence of COVID in the world. Think about that with all the low and middle income countries. And yet we have 74.7% .7 of our population, 18 years of age and older vaccinated. It's not enough. Good is good and not enough here. And I think your point, Andy, about even if we have a 10, 20, 25% part of the population that doesn't believe in science and won't be a part of the solutions that we need to deal with this pandemic, we will see what's continuing to happen in places like Minnesota. And so the, the issue is not whether this is going to be a debate where someone loses, someone wins. We all lose if we don't improve the science literacy and the understanding of science in our world today. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a sad commentary, but in fact, uh, you know, as, as many of you know who are on this today, I've been somewhat heavily criticized for Bad News Mike for suggesting last spring that some of the darkest days of the pandemic were still ahead of us when case numbers are dropping and vaccine was flowing. Um, but to put it in perspective, six of the most critical people I've had in my uh, tenure here during COVID who uh, were all in the media are now dead, all from dying from COVID. That's not what we wanna have happen. This is not a debate where the losers end up be, being seriously ill or dying. That's what we don't wanna have happen. So I think to answer the question specifically, let me just say, I don't know the answer but we can't afford not to keep trying to figure it out. What are we going to do about the body politic? How are we going to get people at all ages, all economic levels, all races, colors, creeds, education levels, what are we gonna to do to help them understand that this virus will not discriminate? It'll keep doing what it's gonna do if whether you comply or, or participate in or are part of the solution. And that's the challenge I think we have today if I had said to any of you on this uh, WebEx today that uh, six weeks, 10 weeks ago, that Minnesota would one day have the highest rate of cases in the country, would be one of the highest rates in the world, no one would have believed it. This is the consequence of what the question you're asking, Andy. And all I can say is we are committed at SIDRAP and, and the world has to be committed to better addressing the anti-science bent that we're now unfortunately experiencing. Well, I think this makes it a, a really important case for why organizations like SIDRAP um, are so vital um, to uh, communicate with the public and communicate um, uh, honestly. And, and it, there's something you said uh, in what you just said, Mike, that I think more important than any prognostication you've made or anything else, which is which is the words we don't know. and. Um, I would say that throughout the pandemic, if people really listened to you, um, I think your cautions have always been um, against um, some over uh, stating of our current knowledge, more so than uh, any prediction on what might happen next. Um, you know, you've been the voice that has said, we ought to be careful about going too far in either direction uh, because there's such great uncertainty. And I remember something you said to me in March of 2020, which is that there's only going to be a certain amount of telling the public that things are dire that people will tolerate, whether or not um, that's true or not, uh, whether or not even if the facts are right, but that we have to be conscious of how people hear and receive things. And so I, I think this humility, this humility to say that people are coming from different places and that there are no absolute truths is something science has a hard time dealing with as a whole. And experts feel like they don't get invited back on the TV shows unless they can they can say definitively what the answer is. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how you managed to to um, introduce this humility, and then maybe speak about it in the in the in the context of not just the people who don't believe in science anymore, but there's a great number of people who may believe, but they're just tired of it. And so how do we communicate to people um, when we are in the middle of, uh, of surging cases, as you say, in Minnesota and other places in the world, when people are in the state that they're in right now relative to the last year and a half? Well, I uh, thank you. I, I think the, the key message here is, is that first and foremost, always just tell the truth. 
If you don't know, just say you don't know. You know, I, as some of you have heard me say in recent months, you know, I wake up every morning and two things happen. First of all, the first uh, song I hear humming in my head when I open my eyes is from that old fifth dimension tune from the 1960s. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. But in this case, the song is, this is the dawning of the age of the variants. The variants were fundamental game changers in what happened uh, to this pandemic. The fact that these mutated viruses, it could be much more infectious, cause more serious illness, uh, even potentially escape the immune protection of vaccines or uh, natural immunity for after being infected, was really important that we laid out there you know, what in fact now does this mean? And so telling the truth about, for example, the vaccines, these are remarkable tools, remarkable tools, but they're not perfect. And so not acknowledging this waning immunity initially, and as Andy, you know, you know, back in, in August, I was very much concerned about waning immunity at a time when no one wanted to hear that. Uh, and yet today we have to deal with it. It's important. Doesn't mean the vaccine still can't work and work well, but booster doses are now a reality. So, I mean, I could go through the laundry list to where we at SIDRAP have just tried to tell the truth. What do we know and not know? Um, so that's number one. Number two is you got to tell it in a way people can understand. You know, this is surely a, a reflection of my upbringing. You know, I was born and raised in a small Iowa farm town where I learned early on if you couldn't sell it to the 10 o'clock coffee club at the S&D Cafe on Main Street, basically it was going to be a hard sell. And so I think we've tried very hard at our center not to talk down or talk up because neither of those are really right. It's just tell the truth in a way that people could understand. And so I think that that has been really important. The final piece is, you know, we're not in this for a popularity contest. We're not in this to have people like us. We're not in this to get on the media as such. We're in it to basically make a difference. You know, I don't need a lot of motivation every morning after I get that humming out of my head and then I scrape the five inches of mud off my crystal ball to understand that today I'm doing this and why I'm on this screen right now. This is about my kids and grandkids. And this is for all of us. You know, what are we doing to make the world a better place? You, you can't know the professional joy, overwhelming personal satisfaction when my kids, grandkids who could have been vaccinated last week are all vaccinated. That's, I think, part of trying to share the message of what's happening with the public is what does that mean? And I think that's what we try very hard to do at SIDRAP. Well, here's to Midwesterners <laughs> and, and that, that very common sense um, the very common sense perspective that you have and that you bring is surely one of the reasons why, uh, you know, you may be doing something right. And when experts um, refute you, yet uh, the real, yet real Americans um, only listen to you more, it might tell you you might be doing something right because you're really trying to connect with people and how they're making decisions. So let's go, go there. Let's now talk about the Americans that are listening. Uh, and those that, that don't want to listen, and the things that they need to know right now. Um, on the one hand, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this like a balance sheet. <laughs> on the one hand, um, we really haven't figured out how to contain the spread of Delta. Uh, it is It continues to, to do what it will when it will, um, and we have not yet figured out how to vaccinate the globe. So um, there may be concerns for more variants, and I'd like you to be able to comment on, on that. Uh, on how that effort works. On the other hand, um, we today, compared to a year ago, have a number of tools. I'll use the word tools because it's the word you use as well, um, that for people to use in their lives, vaccines, obviously, booster shots, portable uh, you know, air, air uh, purifiers, um, monoclonal antibodies, soon um, to be... Uh, uh, pills that, that you can take that are therapeutics if you get COVID, rapid antigen tests. And so my, my question is, if you can comment on, you know, these threats and how you think about them, but also as you bring it to people in their, in their lives, um, with these tools, what does that mean for how people are able to live their lives, even in the context of this pandemic? Well, let me divide this into two really different groups of individuals, one who want to use the tools. They just need the instructions, the support 
to know how to best use them. Uh, you know, there are people today that are uh, concerned about, I willingly jumped on board to get vaccinated and I'm hearing about all these breakthroughs. Was that the right thing to do? The answer is absolutely yes. Today, even though we are seeing waning immunity that can be restored quickly by a booster, you have a six-fold increase of getting infected if you're not vaccinated. You have a 12-fold increase of dying if you're not vaccinated. So we have to reassure the willing that they're doing the right thing. The second thing we have to do is we have to empower the willing. And what I mean by that is, is that even with these very, very amazing tools, these vaccines, we still have people who will likely suffer breakthroughs uh, because of their age. Uh, we know that the challenge of those 75 years of age and older still have uh, uh, problems in terms of their immune response. We know people who have underlying comorbidities, as we call them, increased BMIs, other immunosuppressive conditions. We know that people who have been solid organ uh, re donor recipients uh, and, and uh, stem cell recipients, that they too have a less response. So the next thing is once you get vaccinated, what else can you do to protect yourself and, and allow you to empower yourself? And this is coming home front and center right now during the holiday season. Uh, in my podcast released this morning, which we release every Thursday morning, uh, one of the major discussions is don't be afraid to protect yourself, empower yourself. So if you have family that want to come to your Thanksgiving Day dinner uh, that are not vaccinated, who refuse to get vaccinated, you know, you shouldn't feel guilty about saying that's not going to work. And, and you got to take that bull by the horns and empower yourself. If you are in a community like the Twin Cities right now, or unfortunately states all the way from the Four Corners area right up through the Great Plains, all across Northern America right now, well into the Northeast, Vermont, New Hampshire, we're seeing major increases in transmission. This isn't a time that you wanna put yourself at risk of being in the community. Uh, this is a time when you have to look at how can I protect myself? So I think among the willing, we just need to give them the tools, the things that you're talking about, how to use the best kind of respiratory protection. If I go to the grocery store and I want to have that added uh, benefit of protection. And then we have those that basically don't believe. They're against vaccines, even though they're so well studied. They're, you know, the gold standard of scientific research is what we call a double blind placebo controlled trial. And these vaccines have all been through that. And while they're rejected, we know quite clearly that treatment with drugs like ivermectin, uh, an antiparasitic drug that in uh, levels that many people take it today for COVID is highly toxic. And again, the benefits are zip zero. And yet we see healthcare providers today being sued by family members of some loved one who's in a critical care unit and the staff refuse to treat them with ivermectin and the family is suing to have them treated with it. You know, those I don't know if we're ever going to reach with the tools that we have. And all we can do is just keep trying. And one of the reasons why we want to keep trying is obviously, you know, as I pointed out earlier, I don't want anyone to be harmed by this virus, whether they're a friend or foe. But also, as long as we have this widespread transmission in our communities, two things happen. One is, in fact, we are at increased risk because there's just more infections out there. There's more likelihood that an infected child will bring the virus to school or the infected child will bring it back home or into the daycare. And so we want to limit as much transmission as we can. The second thing is today, I don't think people fully understand, particularly in a state like Minnesota right now, where our healthcare system is incredibly challenged. We're at the point right now where we're not just bending in there are locations we're breaking. And you don't want to be someone today to have a heart attack or a stroke or be in an automobile accident and find that there are no beds for you anywhere near. And I think that that messaging also is please, if for no other reason, understand, even if you don't agree with COVID, if you are one of those individuals who is taking up a bed right now because you're unvaccinated, you are also compromising the health of the entire community. So I, I think we have to split these out. We will continue to work and providing the most current comprehensive information we can to those who are the willing, who wanna use the tools, they just wanna know how to use them best. And for those that won't use the tools or reject them, you know, I'm not gonna give up. Uh, you know, failure is not an option here. Uh, and unfortunately, I hope the virus doesn't 
basically infect them first, cause them serious illness or even death before we hopefully can change uh, their thoughts. Now, some would say, you know, that's naive. You're not going to change it. The body politic is such today that that's not going to happen. Well, you know, I, that may be the case. But we've watched over the course of our history, little events become big events and eventually monumental events that change the course of history. Will we change everyone's mind? No. But maybe today, when that grandfather who's lying in that ICU bed just before he's being intubated, looks up and says, I wish I had been vaccinated, tell all my family to get vaccinated, more and more of those moments are happening and maybe that's where we can begin to keep changing the unwilling to the willing category. So Mike, let me take the skeptical side of the equation for, for a few minutes here, um, which I know will be lots of fun for you. Um, <laughs> Why not say to people who are dead set against getting vaccinated, why keep talking about vaccinations? Why not talk to them about the other tools? Why not talk to them more about, uh, yes, monoclonal antibodies are not as good. They're more expensive. They're taken after the fact. Um, but, but certainly things like, like ventilation, portable ventilation, um, and, and these other things, um, why not emphasize, hey, you've got five or six tools, if you're not going to do one, why not at least do some of the others? Yeah, well, and, and thank you for, for uh, adding that context, because I think you're actually right, uh, very, very right. You know, wherever we can reduce risk, however we can reduce harm, you know, it, it's like we don't want to have to make a trade-off between seatbelts or airbags or the collision computer system on the car that helps you stop uh, an impending rear-end accident. Uh, we don't want to, you know, say you have to pick between, uh, you know, one type of safety measure in your car and another. And uh, we surely don't have to do that here. We should use them all. And if one, like vaccines, are polarizing, if there are other things we can do to limit transmission, yes. And, you know, we have said for a long time that, you know, and I come from a 45-year career of working in influenza, you know, if we can increase building ventilation in an energy-efficient way, uh, you know, look at all the good that that means in terms of respiratory pathogens. I mean, people forget that 40 to 60,000 people a year die in this country from influenza. So doing the things you're talking about, Andy, in terms of improving air quality, improving the kind of respiratory protection. You know, one of the challenges we have in this country right now is all the efficient and effective respiratory protection, the kind of masks you wear are largely occupational based meaning that they were always made for the workplace. We've never really embarked upon highly effective respiratory protection for the citizen. What is the right fit? How does it work in kids? And so I think you're right. There are a lot of other things we can do and we should do them all at the same time. The, the reason I, I, I really have focused on the vaccines or in the antivirals is right now, you know, as they say, it's a hard time to think about draining the swamp when you're up to your south side in alligators. We're up that we're way beyond the south side right now in alligators. So we need as well the most immediate things we can do. But but your point is a really good one. And if we learn nothing else from this pandemic, is we should be embarking in all of these. These are these should be fundamental game changers. You know, people don't realize that for every two days we've lived in the last century, we've gained a day of life expectancy. Think about that, going back 80,000 generations to the caves, we have suddenly changed that whole picture. Now, COVID's challenged that, but why did that occur? That occurred because somebody figured out, you know, drinking all that contaminated water, that wasn't good for you. Suddenly having a water system in place, oh my, look what that did, and a safe water system. And so I think the whole point about air is only gonna become more important that way, and I, I agree with you 100%. So what about people who say that we overestimate the risk to people of COVID-19? And I, an epidemiologist did this analysis for me. It's roughly right. Basically said the chances if you drive 50 miles or more of being in a fatality on the highway is this Thanksgiving season, if you're driving to a loved one, is one per 100,000. So if 100,000 people get on the highway, one of them is going to get in a fatal accident and not be here. And if you look at Minnesota's level, even today of COVID, your chances of going to Thanksgiving somewhere, contracting COVID and dying, if you're unvaccinated, is about one in 100,000. 
And if you're vaccinated, it's about, as you said, it's about a sixth of that. And so, you, could you made this point earlier about if you're inviting someone to your dinner and you're vaccinated, but they're not, um, saying, you know, that you're not gonna allow that to happen. But if you look at some of this cold, hard data on actual risk, you know, what it would suggest is your ride over to the Thanksgiving dinner is going to be riskier if you're vaccinated. And, and, it, and so if you have unvaccinated people there, it doesn't matter. Now that doesn't take into account everything. There's lots of other externalities, including continuing the spread, including long COVID, et cetera. But what do you say to people who, who, who say, I don't, I think this risk is being overblown. I, I think we could be making decisions to live our lives more, I'll call it assertively, and uh, th then we are because we're over we're over calculating yeah. this risk. Well, you know, one of the challenges we have is that uh, COVID tends to be very episodic, meaning that if you look right now, probably one of the safest places in the country to be is in uh, the deep south. You know, in rural Louisiana right now, it probably has one of the lowest rates of transmission anywhere in the country because after that surge occurred this past summer, numbers dropped down dramatically to a pre-surge level. On the other hand, if you're here in Minnesota right now, particularly certain county areas, that risk is very different. So I think that even using the numbers you used, and we could surely have a great discussion about that. Let me just use a set of numbers which I think uh, may even provide a more stark reminder of the importance of COVID. If you assume that the Delta surge started roughly in late June, which is when it did in this country, and you look at where we're at today, since late June, and you realize we are a country that was flush in vaccine, where clearly everyone could have had a dose of vaccine. Since late June, 140,000 people have died from COVID. 140,000. And they wouldn't have had to die if they had been willing to be vaccinated. The vast, vast majority were never vaccinated. And so I think that when at a population level, you look at what COVID has done, it's the first time in the history of our country we've actually seen states that have had less population at the end of the year than they started at the beginning of the year. And it wasn't because of migration now, it was because of deaths increased. So I think that from a standpoint of this, those are very abstract numbers. But what it all comes down to is how we all independently basically respond to that. So, you know, I would say to the grandpa and grandma who are coming to Thanksgiving Day dinner, who may have an underlying health condition that would put them at high risk of having a serious illness and death, then they should feel empowered to say, I don't want to put myself into that position and not feel somehow guilted into that they need to do that. Um, and so I, I still maintain that position. I will maintain that position. And I would just summarize it in the sense of saying there's no right or wrong answers in a sense, there's no easy answers. And this was really put to me uh, some months ago when a, uh, a very famous Civil War historian, after we had, a, had had a long discussion about what was happening to our country around COVID, he looked at me and he said, you know, Mike, for the first time in my career, I finally understand what mothers and fathers must have felt when half their sons went to fight for the North and half went and sought to fight for the South. That was a very telling, telling moment. And you know, there are a lot of people who are listening today who have been in the middle of these very same difficult moments. So you're right, we've got to use the numbers, we've got to put them out there. Uh, I can tell you right now, I don't need a number to understand that we've got a healthcare system that is bending and breaking. We've got healthcare workers who are quitting their job daily because finally after two years, the stress is so dramatic, so, so painful that they're leaving, which is only accentuating the problem of trying to find adequate staff for these intensive care units. That hadn't happened before. You know, in 45 years in the business that I've been in, I've never seen that before, even with HIV. And so I think that this by itself gives a sense of what we're up against. Well, and I think what you're saying, and it's very well stated, is that if you can take a simple precaution, why wouldn't you? And if it just decreases your odds, no matter what the numbers are, <coughs> why, why wouldn't you take that, that additional precaution? 
And I think the, the place where I'm pushing a little bit <laughs> is people who've been vaccinated and who've done what they believe to be the right things and are taking precautions. If we're sitting here, let's just say we're, let's say it's two years from now, it's 2023, and the situation is largely what it looks like today, um, same levels of risk, et cetera. Um, you know, people feel years of their lives going by, um, you know, they, they may, you know, should they, um, the, the risk of being estranged from family, you know, starts to add mm -hmm. up, the cost, I shouldn't say the risk, the cost, et cetera. And so I think a lot of people, what a lot of people are struggling with is, is very practical. This goes back to the people in the diner, is what portion of the things that are important to me should I give up? Maybe I like going to a Twins game or a Timberwolves game. No, that's a stretch. Nobody likes going to Timberwolves games. <laughs> but maybe I like, uh, you know, going to a concert, an indoor concert that I, that I just get so much pleasure out of, seeing my family at Thanksgiving. And I'm taking precautions. I've been vaccinated. My odds are much, much better. Um, but I want to know how to think about these daily risks. Yeah. And I want to know how to offset them with the joys. You know, you talk, you talk very movingly, and I appreciate when you do this, about your grandkids and, and hugging your grandkids and why uh, and what that, what that means to you. And I think everyone in America can relate to that. And they want to do the, mo the majority of people want to do the right thing. The vast majority of people want to live. Uh, so they, but they really want to understand at what point do they lean back in to some of these normal things, even when there are some risks? You know, I, and, and this is a very critical question we have to answer, and our group has tried to, and I try to cover this in my weekly podcast. You know, it's not just that we've had to try to come to grips with how we die with this virus, but as I said months and months ago, it's also how do we live with it? What do we do? What are the risks that we assume? And I think that we're still really on the road to greatly reducing these risks in a way that makes the personal choices much simpler. You know, right now, I mean, I have to say, with all honesty, thank God I am not an organ recipient because the best data we have shows right now that the vaccines are only about 50% protective against developing serious illness and even dying if you get COVID, if you're an organ recipient. Now, you know what? That's not abstract if you're one of those people. That's real. That's scary. And I think that what we're trying to do is figure out for the whole entire population where the risk is, is very low for young children to have serious illness and die. But at the same time, during this recent surge in the United States, over 10,000 kids aged 5 to 11 have been hospitalized, one-third in intensive care. During this surge with Delta, it has been the number fifth cause of death in kids five to 11 years of age. So I can talk all I want about, you know, it's low risk, it's all these things. And so I think you're right. One of the things we have to do is come to grips with how do we live with this virus? What are the risks we accept? You know, I often joke about the fact, imagine the guy laying in his living room floor having an acute myocardial infarction and the EMTs are there they got him stabilized. They're going to transport him in the emergency room. He says, well, I can't go with you. It's too dangerous to ride in that ambulance. I may get in an accident on the way to the hospital. And you sit there and say, come on, buddy. You know, put your wrist into perspective, okay? And I think that's what we're going to have to do a lot more with COVID over time. But I think there's a lot more we can still do to lower the risk. I think the vaccines, learning to how to use them better, the antiviral drugs. I think so many things that we can do to, to really limit risk yet, and then make it an easier equation. As you and I have talked before, Andy, I mean, as I said, we, you know, we have 40 to 60,000 people that die annually in an average flu year in this country. We don't shut down the country. We don't quit, you know, going to school. We don't basically shut down businesses. And, you know, at some point we are going to have to come to grips with how do we deal with this? But I think right now this uh, COVID tsunami, when it hits, and it's like a tsunami. It doesn't hit yesterday, it doesn't hit tomorrow, but it hits today and it hits hard. How do we deal with that? And, and how does that enter into our everyday thinking? Great, let's talk about kids a little bit uh, because I think a lot of parents and a lot of people are confused about um, now that they can get kids vaccinated, uh, should kids five to 11 continue to wear masks? Should schools continue to, to ask kids to wear masks or require kids to wear masks? Um, 
you know, how to think about that risk. And then also the, there are a number of people who are very pro-vaccine and very pro-COVID vaccine who just aren't sure yet whether they want to give the vaccine to their five to 11 year olds uh, because they look at that, um, that, that, that risk reward trade-off or the, the risk benefit yep. trade-off and they're, and they're just uncertain. Um, and uh, you know, I think there, I think we have the great benefit of having 28,000 pediatricians who are capable of having these conversations with parents um, ab about about this with their kids, because these are very individual decisions at some level. Um, that, what do you what do you think about? What are you recommending? What are you saying in terms of 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 where that leaves parents and what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing? Well, again, I think we have to tell the story of COVID in kids in a much more effective way, meaning that, you know, I just have thrown out some abstract numbers, but those numbers are just numbers. They're not people. You know, one of the things I try very hard in my podcast, and we at SIDRAP try never to forget, is behind every one of those numbers is a person. It's a grandpa, a grandma, a mom or dad, a brother and sister, and unfortunately, even a child. And I think that that People want to understand more internalized, uh, you know, what does this mean for me? Uh, I can tell you that, and there are people who are on uh, this program right now who have suffered through children who have been severely ill with COVID over the course of the past uh, uh, month to two months. And the question becomes, I think, you know, how do you translate that into information that then you can act on or think about? And, and I think that middle group that you've talked about, and there are three groups of parents as it relates to vaccinating five to 11 year olds. The Kaiser Family Foundation data has clearly shown that about a third of parents couldn't wait to get the vaccine for their kids. They are the ones calling 12 clinics a day until they could get an appointment. Thank you, by the way, for that. There were those in the middle that said, you know, I'm not against these vaccines, but I want more information. I want to understand what they do, what they're not doing, what their safety issues are. We owe that group a lot more information as we get it. The problem is, is that if this was a regular vaccine research and development and licensure process, like we see with so many other of our vaccines, we'd have had five, seven years of research under our belt before an application would have ever been made to approve the vaccine. Well, you know, I don't have the data right now before me on five to 11 year olds for what the two year outcome is after having been vaccinated. We have to accept that that's what we're working on. You know, we're flying this plane at 30,000 feet and also building it at the same time. We know what the safety data are, what we're trying to figure out is how best to use it. But so we owe that middle group that. But then the third group that is, are the group of parents who say under no condition I vaccinate my kids. You know, that goes back to your earlier question. I don't have an answer for that, but that's not an acceptable answer. We need to better understand how do we deal with both the scientific uh, beliefs in this country, as well as, I guess, what you'd call the body politic. And so I don't have a, a good answer for that, but that doesn't mean we can't and shouldn't keep trying to find that answer. Great. Um, how do you feel about mandates, Mike? Well, I actually support the mandate in the sense that um, it is all about not just the individual, it's about the community. And what I mean by that is I've already pointed out that if you don't get infected, you're not infectious to others. We know that we have data that shows that even if you're a breakthrough, uh, you'll shed the virus for a shorter period of time. And at least some of the studies show less transmission. Uh, you know, if somebody wants to drink and drive, and they want to be intoxicated behind the wheel because it's their choice to do what they want. We say, no, you don't have that choice. That's a choice, basically, you've done whatever you would do to your body, but you're a risk to the community. I think in the public health action world, mandates are actually critical to doing two things. One is actually truly reducing risk and making it so that we have less transmission uh, in the community particularly for those who can't protect themselves because despite being vaccinated, they still have an increased risk of having a breakthrough and could be serious because of their underlying health conditions. So I think from that standpoint, this is about community good. The second piece of it is, is that as we see in these surges in particular, when people get infected, they take a bed if they become seriously ill. And they're more likely to be seriously if they're unvaccinated. Well, now that begins to affect a lot of other things. 
Do you know how many horror stories we're well aware of of people who after being in the ED emergency room department for 18 hours finally died from their heart attack because nobody could find him a bed? You know, we have also a community good that's all about providing the most, the most for those that need it the most. And in this case, if you could help reduce the amount of COVID in our healthcare systems, that will surely help also in terms of others who need health care. One of the ways to accomplish that is the mandate. I understand the challenges with that. I don't want for a moment not to appreciate and acknowledge about the personal choice aspect of that. Uh, but I think when you're looking at the greater community good, I very much support the mandates. And I point to a letter that you and I both signed that came out today. Uh, if people want to want to uh, see what a number of experts are recommending. Let me now ask you what I think is going to be the toughest question you've ever been asked. Do yes. We, do we <laughs> underinvest or overinvest in public health as a country? Oh, we greatly underinvest. Uh, if people had any idea that the surveillance system that we have today, trying to figure out how many cases are occurring, what their outcomes are, is held together largely by bailing twine and barbed wire. We actually still have health departments in this country that are submitting records by fax machine. That is how antiquated and outdated our system is. We have invested so little into public health infrastructure. But the second part of this is, which is something that is totally foreign to me and something that I am wrestling with because it involves very, very personal relationships. I'm watching a core group of public health leaders who are walking away. They are beaten. Their post-traumatic stress syndrome is far too much. They have been at the other end of the kinds of horrible, horrible uh, behaviors that have occurred about public health. Uh, you know, I, I had cut my teeth early in the early days in HIV AIDS. I was involved in the very earliest meetings. Most people don't realize this, but as state epidemiologist, I was responsible for uh, making in Minnesota HIV reportable, the first government body in the world to do so at a time that gay men had every reason to be concerned about a government list. At the time, AIDS was reportable, but not HIV. And we understood to really deal with the epidemic of HIV, we had to know when it was happening, not a year later or two years later when somebody developed AIDS. Despite all of these tough times, I never, never experienced anything like I have recently. Death threats, uh, you know, the kinds of horrible, horrible emails. This week has been one of those bad weeks. And I think that I look at this and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm able to just keep going because I have such incredible support from my colleagues, family and friends. But I'm watching a lot of our public health leaders just saying, I can't do this anymore. Well, I worry about the loss of that critical leadership well, along with the lack of funding. Well, let's talk about that, that support. Let's get more specific even, um, you know, we, we, the consequence that there's this sort of general thought in society by some that we shouldn't really be spending money on things we don't see and need every day. And that, uh, we shouldn't be investing in, in things be, that, are, that aren't super visible. And, you know, for the, for the hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars that have been cut over decades, uh, we've now spent trillions um, dealing with that, that lack of investment and we're still dealing with it. And so, you know, you have a saying every day uh, about the, 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 the dawning of the age of the variants. I have a saying also, and it goes something like, thank God for SIDRAP. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm just wondering if you can tell people, you know, in the, in the, in the age of like all this pressure, all this attack, the lack of funding, you guys show up every day with the, the facts, the Midwestern approach uh, and everything. I'm wondering if you could tell people who have given and been the philanthropists to SIDRAP over the years, what you've been able to do with that investment. Well, thank you for that opportunity. I mean, first of all, let me just say that I realize I'm the talking head that's on this screen today, but I just represent a very small part of who and what SIDRAP is. I work with 24 of the most amazing people who have been at SIDRAP for many, many years. Uh, the leadership team of Chris Moore and Jill DeBoer and I have been together now for over 36 years. 
and uh, uh, you know we have eight graduate students and undergraduate students working there. So we have an incredible team, and they work on a lot of different issues. Uh, clearly, COVID is front and center, but we also work very, very much on the issues of antibiotic resistance and how we're going to try to reduce the ever-increasing challenge with that, where we literally are entering an era of a post-antibiotic time, which is hard to imagine, uh, and, and the resistance is a huge issue. Uh, you know, we've been very involved with influenza vaccine work. We were the group that uh, literally led an international effort of the World Health Organization, the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, uh, to be able to put together an influenza vaccine roadmap for what the vaccine should look like in the future. For those people who are hunters on this screen, you uh, know that we've been very involved with chronic wasting disease, this prion-related disease in white-tailed deer, which we worry very much is going to result in potential transmission to humans. So we, we've done a lot of things. One of the most notable programs that we have right now is what we call the Resilient Drug Supply Project. This was a project that was graciously funded by Christy Walton uh, when she saw a need for the fact that today, many of the life-saving critical drugs we need every day are coming from China or India, and the supply chains are incredibly, incredibly challenged, and people can't get drugs. But for Christy's uh, generosity and support, we would have been able to do that work. And our news team, we have an amazing group of news teams. Uh, you know. Uh, we have right now published well over uh, 40 million pages of information and have been downloaded just in the last year around everything from COVID, et cetera. Um, and, but for the philanthropic support of the Vincent Foundation and uh, Lori Kauth and Judy uh, Dutcher, you know, we wouldn't have been able to help support that or uh, the unorthodox philosophy of uh, uh, philanthropy from Mark Lampert has helped us be able to support much of the information on our website. So we have been very, very appreciative recipients of this kind of support because it's what allows us to do what otherwise people won't pay for. People don't want to pay for information. They don't want to pay you to do a lot of these things. And so uh, the whole phil philanthropic approach has been a very critical piece for us. So I'm going to assume that people like myself um, if we didn't get it before, we're starting to get it now, that that you don't invest in places like SIDRAP at your peril, uh, that we, will, we end up in a place where even more than the 20% of people who don't believe in science don't have a reliable source, don't have a reliable place to go, where we end up in a world where um, Facebook becomes the only voice on what to believe or not to believe with regard to the vaccine, because um, there aren't the 24 people who are working around the clock uh, on getting facts out and getting facts out in a practical way like, like you just did today. So, um, I, you know, I think um, that I would be shocked if there isn't a massive line or a rush of people <laughs> saying, how do I support Mike Osterholm and SIDRAP uh, uh, as, as we should be supporting other things in the country uh, like this? How do we help spark the next generation of public health leaders. The, you mentioned some that are burned out. There are many young people today who are gonna to wanna to make their career in public health because they've lived through this and they need a shining light. They need a place to go. They need opportunities. So um, you know, I wanna, I wanna make an a, a announcement with you here and with, with SIDRAP that I think is pretty exciting. Um, I've been told, I have it under good authority, <laughs> that the SIDRAP and the School of Public Health are embarking on a campaign, a $10 million fundraising campaign uh, to set a sustainable course um, for doing exactly what you just described. Now, um, I think you'll probably raise that in a couple of days and have to amp up the number <laughs> further. Um, and the reason I, one reason I say that is because I, I also learned that there's a $4 million matching gift. So if people, give money to SIDRAP, it'll be matched dollar for dollar. Now, if you give more than 4 million, it won't all be matched. But if you give up to 4 million, um, there's a really great chance. And that's going to be matched by someone named Christy Walton, who is a philanthropist and the founder of someplace called I Alumbra. Uh, $4 million matching gift. Wow. That is incredible. Um, again, for every $2 raised, 
um, that Christy will match with an additional dollar. I think I had it wrong before. For every two dollars raised, she's going to match with an additional dollar until said wrap reaches its very unambitious target of ten million dollars. Um, and I say very unambitious because I can't imagine um, that um, we're not we're not uh, going to want to support organizations. By the way, great swag. I'm just saying, great <laughs> swag. Uh, and, and you, Mike, I, you know, I think people have asked the question, how do I say thanks to the public health experts out there? How do I show them that I support them? When, when, when Mike gets tons of emails from people calling him names and, 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 and giving him death threats, and I hear a lot of people saying, how do I send the message that I got your back, that I'm on your side, that there's way more supporters than there are detractors? And... And, you know, I think, Mike, nothing would be better than for you and the people on your team to feel a massive wave of support, even if people are only giving small amounts of money uh, to uh, to SIDRAP, to say those people who are threatening public health um, are a loud but very, very, very tiny minority in this country. And I think the only way we can prove that is with that level of support. Uh, and you know, I just I just know that the incremental dollar that comes to SIDRAP is going to be a dollar to make the country better. Well, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, uh, those kind words. Uh, I will be the first to admit to anyone on here that I am very very poor at fundraising because I find that very uncomfortable. Uh, I just want to do my work and uh, the work of the group. I will be the first to acknowledge that often what we do uh, is such that it's not supported. Uh, SIDRAP actually became one of the very first organizations in the world to report on COVID-19 back in December of 2019. We actually published a story in the end of December on that issue. So, I mean, we were there, but had we not had the kind of unrestricted support that allowed our news team and all of us to quickly uh, get together on that. And I don't think most people know that actually on January 20th of 2020, we actually put out a, a piece saying that this was gonna cause the next pandemic and we had to move quickly. So it's hard to take an organization like ours and actually move quickly without more uh, support and resources. And so uh, I promise you that uh, for anyone who might be so kind to help support us, uh, the, we will be very, very good stewards of, of your money. And so I, uh, I, I appreciate that. We. Uh, you know, we have a lot of challenges ahead of us and we're not gonna stop till we solve those challenges, how many decades it takes. You know, I, I, I have a dream and my dream is that I get a second chance to do something that most people never get a first chance. Uh, you know, I started the Minnesota Department of Health back in 1975 when there were just several people with bachelor's level degrees uh, and uh, that was it for infectious diseases and I, through a series of mishaps, mistakes, and somehow I don't know how else, uh, I ultimately came in charge of that group uh, in the late 1970s. And by the time I left, basically to come back to the university, we had a world-class team of academic public health researchers, public health uh, officials at the MDH. And I watch today with such great pride, such great pride that that department has continued to maintain that international excellence as a public health agency. Well, I have that same vision for SIDRAP. I don't plan on going anywhere soon, but the bottom line is, is that SIDRAP is needed. There is a real absolute need for someone that can translate research and policy into a single effort and to be relevant and to make a difference. And so uh, my goal here is uh, get a second bite at the apple to leave behind one day an organization that is in fact dedicated to making the world a better place for our kids and our grandkids. And if I can do that, that'll be everything I can. So, and I also work at the University of Minnesota, you know, as you heard President Gable say, I've been here now for 46 years and I can't tell you how, how much I appreciate the support I've had from the university as has SIDRAP. It's been remarkable uh, across the board, every president. And right now uh, the foundation, uh, Jess Qual, who is to me uh, uh, such a key, key piece to what we're doing here today. Thank you for all you've done. And Andy, I just wanna thank you. I wanna thank you on behalf of, I think a very grateful number of public health people in a nation 
for all you've done. I watched what you did to make these vaccines a reality. I've watched how you, you could cut through red tape faster than anybody I've ever known. And like I said at the beginning, you know, if it's broken and you can't fix it, call Andy. And uh, that's uh, that's what you've done. So thank you very much for your comments and, and, and thank you to everyone who's been online here today, listening to this conversation. Great. Um, I think from there, Mike, I believe we are just about done with the call. I want to just uh, thank everybody for attending. I want to um, remind people that this was a really, um, it tended to be an informative call, but it also is a call for uh, making a decision of whether or not we're going to take the work that gets done, et cetera, for granted and just assume it's going to get done or whether it's something we're going to support. I think that's an individual decision. There's lots of places worthy of support, but I can't think of um, a better message to send it, uh, coming through this pandemic than, than, than this one. And, you know, I would just say one final thing. When, when Mike, I, I know this for a fact, and Mike's modest, but when he gets called by a governor or a mayor or someone and, and says, we need help, and he mobilizes half a dozen people overnight, quickly, and responds, gets results, he doesn't charge him for that. There's no bill at the end of that. He does that because he does that for us. Uh, he does that for all the people who are living in this country and in the state. And so uh, that kind of thing doesn't just happen. That kind of thing happens because of the support that, that you all provide to SIDRAP and to the University of Minnesota. So thank you and thank you again for attending. Thank you, all of you, thank you.